this time on RRC Restoration, I will be taking on the challenge of restoring to a roadworthy condition this very rare Ducati 748 SPS that has lay here in this shed along with these other poor bikes for a number of years now, as the owner was planning on restoring them, but the years passed and that never happened. As you can clearly see, it's in a pretty poor state, all covered in dust, cobwebs, and with every steel part covered in rust. But, not to worry, I'm on the case now, and it can all be fixed. So, let's get the bike loaded into the van, tied down, and start on the long journey back to the workshop. With this bike, I'll be taking a slightly different approach. Usually, with a bike like this, it would be taken to a million bits and restored just like the 916 was. You can find that restoration up here. But with this bike, it's going to be different, as I already have the new owner lined up for this one, and he only wants me to get it running again and to have it mechanically perfect, and to tidy up a little so he can ride it for a few seasons and take it to the track without worrying too much about dropping it. Personally, I think that's the wrong move, but business is business. So with the 748 on the left, I can start to make a list of all the jobs needing done, and the first one is going to be giving it a serious cleaning. Other jobs that instantly stand out are that the tyres will need changed as they are dated 2011 and are well out of date, the rear shot will need to be checked over and restored, The front fork seals are damaged and leaking. The headlights have clouded up inside so we'll need stripped down and cleaned out. The brakes front and rear will all need a rebuild as they are very rusty and feel like they are beginning to seize. And then we have the job of sorting out the paintwork that the previous owner did start but didn't finish. Now let's get cleaning, but before we attack it with the soapy bubbles, let's get the ECU safely out of harm's way. You can see a rubber grommet on top of the ECU. Removing it gives you instant access to the EEPROM chip, making it very easy to get it reprogrammed or to swap out chips depending on your bike's setup. This bike is all standard apart from the Terminione exhaust system, so in this case, 
there should be a chip fitted that compensates for the change, otherwise the bike will be running too lean. As you can see here, the chip is for the correct model, and the 066 code tells me that it's correct for the Termi system too. If it was the 060 code, that would be the chip for the standard exhaust system. Now, let's get started with the cleaning session. Much better. Now, let's get in amongst the oily bits. So before I go any further and start turning the engine over to assess its condition, I need to check that the timing belts are still in one piece so that we don't accidentally do any valve damage. Well, with the covers off and the belts exposed, they are looking a bit old and crusty, but will be more than strong enough to stand up to the next couple of tests. First of which will be to remove the spark plugs, fit the engine turning tool, and give the engine a few rotations by hand to check that it isn't seized or making any strange noises. The spark plugs are looking a little black, but I don't see anything to be concerned about. Now for the moment of truth. Does the engine even turn? Well that's all good, no issues there. Now let's power it up for the first time and do a compression test.
150 PSI's in both cylinders. That's a cracking reading for an engine that is stone cold and hasn't been running for years. The last health check item on the list is the valve clearances. So it's out with the notepad and feeler gauges. Well that's a big relief for me and the bike's new owner. All the clearances are within spec, so no need to undertake the lengthy job of replacing shims. Now we can drop the oil and start the process of getting the bike looking good again. The oil is still a nice cherry red colour, yet another healthy sign. With the clutch pack now removed, I can check if it's still in a serviceable state. So I will be checking the friction plate thickness, spring free length, and checking the steel plates for warpage. And just like everything else so far, the clutch is well within the specified limits. Now let's pull the side casings and get them tidied up a bit. Pulling the generator casing is slightly more difficult than the clutch casing, as a puller needs to be used to break it free. If you go at this casing with hammers and levers, you will break it. Trust me.
now blasted back to bare alloy, they are given a light etch priming before being top coated with my custom mixed paint that matches the original finish perfectly once cured. And while I've got the spray booth running, it makes sense to do the spot repairs on the frame at the same time. Well, now it's time to fit the new timing belts, but first, the old ones need to come off. There is nothing obvious wrong with the old belts to look at, but when you feel them, they just feel old and brittle, so definitely a good thing that they are being changed. The bearings and the idlers and tensioners feel really nice, but I'll know for sure in a moment when I get them up to speed on the sketchy bench grinder, while cleaning all the rust from the running faces. So the bearings feel perfect and the faces of the idlers have cleaned up perfectly, so I'm more than happy for these to go back into service for another season. Now let's get the new belts on and get the engine safe again. Having fitted the belts and turned the engine over a couple of times to settle the belts, I can now tension them so that they are as close as possible to the specified tension. In this case, it's 110 Hz.
before tensioning the vertical cylinder, it first needs to be rotated to TDC. What I like to do now is to give the engine a couple of more rotations by hand and then give the belts one final tension check for peace of mind. And then I can make a start on fitting the casings and other ancillaries. With all the engine work now done, apart from the service items, which I'm leaving to later on, I can now make a start on the brakes and suspension. I'm taking off the rear shock to check for any play or leaks, and also to remove the spring to send out for powder coating. I was planning on doing it myself, but unfortunately my powder coating setup isn't ready yet, but it will be up and running for the next project. The shop looks in good condition apart from being quite dirty, so there will be no need to open it up. However, if you would like to see how a rear shock is torn down and rebuilt, I highly recommend watching episode 4 of my CR250 restoration series.
So while the spring is out being re-coated, let's get the brakes rebuilt. So with the calipers now spotless clean, I can rebuild them with all new bolts and seals. The pistons however will be reused as they are ceramic and have no wear on them. You've seen me do this job in this video, this one too, and you guessed it, this one too. So I'll just skip ahead this time. And while I was building the brake gallopers, the shock was reassembled too. I've not shown it as it's just the exact reversal of the disassembly process.
the wheel nut will be torqued to spec once the bike is back on the ground. Now let's get the subframe back where it belongs. So with the subframe back in place, I think now is as good a time as any to have a cup of green tea and sit down and sort out this mess of wiring. Now it's time to sort out the leaking forks, but before I remove them from the bike I need to loosen the top caps as doing it with the forks free is a nightmare. At this point all the books will tell you that you need special tools to remove the damper rod, but if you think about it logically you can do the exact same job with two M10 bolts and a vise as you can see here.
Now it's time for the reassembly. This is just the reverse yet again. So, first the dust seal, retaining clip, new oil seal, washer, and then the bushings. Then it can be filled with the specified amount of oil, level checked, and buttoned back up. And there we have it, one fork leg rebuilt. The top cap will be torqued to spec once it's held securely on the bike again. Now it's time to get rid of the hideous brake reservoirs that are on the bike and replace them with these nice OE spec Brembo ones. Before torquing up the front axle clamp bolts, I need to fit the front calipers. I'll explain why in a moment.
Now to explain why I didn't torque the clamp bolts until I had fit the front wheel and calipers. To allow the front suspension to settle where it naturally wants to sit, you need to leave the clamp bolts loose and rock the bike back and forth a few times while sharply applying the brakes. This just settles the front end, meaning that when it's torqued down, it's sitting in its natural unstressed position. Now to attack the fogged up headlights. The only way to clean them without splitting the glass from the plastic is to fling them in a tub with some dish soap and get in there with a selection of brushes at weird angles and do the best you can to scrub off all the fogginess and eventually they should come clean again. If not, rinse and repeat until they do. They look much better already, but I'll know for sure after they are rinsed and left to dry for an hour or two. And while it's drying, I'm going to get the exhaust fitted. Much better. Now, let's cue the ill-fitting music and get them put back together. Now to freshen up the paintwork. As I mentioned earlier on, this isn't a full restoration. If you want to see a full restoration full of juicy details, remember to check out my 916 restoration, as can be seen here. To freshen up these panels, I will be finishing the job the previous owner started. I will cover the primed areas before blending the colour with the existing finish to achieve an invisible repair.
I'm clear coating all of the panels except the tail unit at the moment, as I have a bit more work to do on it before clearing. What I need to do now is unmask the number boards and pray to the gods that I've laid it out right. And if I have, I can then lay out the gold pin stripe. Again, it looks like an easy satisfying job, but it's actually rather stressful as one wrong move and you could damage or stain some of the unprotected base coat and then you have to start all over again. While all the clear coat is curing, it's the perfect time to finish off all the mechanical jobs that are left to do. Well I think it's safe to say that when your air filters start turning to dust, it's time to change them. Out of curiosity though, if you know roughly how many years it takes for filter foam to turn to dust, I'd love to know. Just leave a comment below. If you're enjoying this video so far, and you'd like to see more of them in the future, please consider joining me over on Patreon, where you and all my other valued patrons help keep this channel alive and kicking. Without your support, I can hand on heart say that I wouldn't be able to keep these restoration projects going. Anyway, let's continue with the service and get the bike fired up for the first time in years.
And that's all the mechanical work done and dusted. Now let's fit the airbox and fuel tank and get the bike fired up for the first time. Before trying to start the engine, I turn the ignition on and off a couple of times to prime the fuel system. Well, I couldn't be happier with the way that sounds. Now, let's get the fairings on and get it out for road test.
And just like that, we are done and dusted. Now, let's get it out on the road for a nice gentle test ride. Well, I couldn't be any happier with the way that went. Now, I hope you will enjoy these before and after shots. And before I go, I want to say a massive thank you to all of my supporters over on Patreon, whose names you can see scrolling past at the moment. 
Without the support of these awesome folks, these videos would grind to a halt. So thank you so much guys, and I'll see you all again soon with the next project.